Hello and welcome. My name is Bill Hayton and I'm an Associate Fellow with the Asia Pacific Programme at Chatham House. And I'm here to chair this panel discussion about how the UK can learn from Japan's experience in Southeast Asia. This is the second discussion in a three-part series held in partnership with Japan House in London. And we thank them for supporting this webinar and the broader series that we're hosting on Japan and the world. The first event, which was on Japan and Africa, was held last year and can be seen on Chatham House's uh, YouTube channel. But today I'm joined by three excellent analysts of current affairs in Southeast Asia. Ben Bland is the director of the Chatham House Asia Pacific program and a former reporter with the Financial Times in Vietnam, Singapore and Indonesia, among other places. Mia Oba is professor at Kanagawa University in Japan. She specializes in the development of regionalism in Asia, the way that the various countries there attempt to use regional structures to manage the shifting power balance in Asia. She's also chair of a Japanese foreign ministry expert panel examining 50 years of Japan ASEAN friendship and cooperation, which is about to report in a few days time, I think. And Motuza is a fellow at the, uh, at the IC's uh, Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore, where she's currently the acting coordinator of the Myanmar Studies Programme. Before joining IC, she spent almost 10 years working for the ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta. Welcome to you all and welcome to everybody watching as well. Today's discussion is on the record and is being recorded. We'll be happy to take your questions uh, about halfway through. Please post them in the Q&A box below and indicate whether you would like me to read your question or whether you would like to ask it yourself. Just to set up today's discussion, the UK became a dialogue partner for, of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, a year and a half ago. It had obviously been previously part of the European Union's collective dialogue with ASEAN. But after Brexit, the British government sought a new independent relationship. So today's discussion is looking at the question of what Britain might learn from Japan's experience. Japan has been a formal ASEAN dialogue partner since 2004, but informally since 1973. So what might Britain be able to offer ASEAN going forward? And bearing in mind that today is the second anniversary of the military coup in Myanmar, we'll be asking what Britain, Japan and ASEAN can do to help reduce the suffering there. But let's begin with the big picture. And my first question is to Mia Oba. What benefits do you think Japan and ASEAN gain from their dialogue partner relationship? Uh, thank you, Will, so for the question. And um, I'm so glad to be here and uh, join this uh, webinar. So thank you so much. And then, so yes, start. So Japan had to open had had two open dialogue with ASEAN in the 1970s and 1973 to talk over trade friction. So with over the synthetic river, so with some of the ASEAN countries. So this is the start point of the Japan-ASEAN dialogue. So at that time, so Southeast Asian countries were concerned about the revival of the Japan Japanese imperialism, which uh, 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 when they encountering the massive expansion of the Japanese economic presence in the Southeast Asia. So against the background, the Japanese government so has a position the strengthening the relation with the ASEAN as an important pillar so of its policy towards Southeast Asia. So in order to dispel the concern of these ASEAN countries and to ensure a stable and friendly relationship with these countries, from this point of view, the dialogue partner relationship provides us mainly three benefits for Japan. The first one is that Japan could demonstrate Japan's will to tighten political relationship with the Southeast Asian countries with respect of the ASEAN centrality. The second one is that Japan could build and enhance trust so between the Japan and the ASEAN. The third one is that the dialogue partner relationship between the ASEAN and Japan function, the, uh, function to provide the platform 
to extend view about how are the common challenges for both sides. So, and what Japan and the ASEAN countries should practic practically uh, promote cooperation to deal with these challenges. So, so then, so that partnership is very important. So, uh, system for both of both Japan and ASEAN. That's all. Great, thank you. That's really frank and kind of you, you sort of forget what an era it was back then when people were worried about those kind of issues yes. and how much things have changed in the interim. And I guess that is an indicator maybe of the success of the dialogue. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah. And Mo, from the ASEAN side, do you think the ASEAN countries saw it in the same way? Thanks, Bill. Um, good morning to you in the, in the United Kingdom. Good afternoon from where I am. Uh, thanks, um, thanks for um, allowing me to share my views. And since I have the mic for the first time, I'd also like to um, thank Chatham House and Japan House in London for making this conversation possible. Bill, you will remember I was just talking about this with you before our panel started. Seven years ago, we also had a conversation organized by Chatham House too at the time about Japan's regional role um, in ASEAN. Um, and, and I think this, uh, you know, the conversation we're having today and, and Mia's um, observations really um, highlight uh, some really important um, important truths, if you will, and realities as well. And okay, you asked me for the 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 ASEAN, the view from ASEAN. Okay, I am I like to see myself as an ASEAN citizen, of course. I'm a national of an ASEAN member state. Um and and I think looking at it uh, really from from this part of the region, um in the 70s, of course, there was the Fukuda doctrines, a heart to heart approach, mm -hmm. then uh the very conscious effort of um I think using the, the Plaza Accord um, outcome for the, the development of Southeast Asian economies, of course, in, in, in those days, it was also very much uh, economic oriented. There were economic advantages and gains to be had, um, as well as the recognition, um, referring back to what Mie has just observed so eloquently, of, of somehow, uh, shall we say, righting the wrongs of the past in a way that allows for both sides to move forward together constructively and look to the future rather than you know, dwelling on, on hard experiences of the past. And I think that's what um, countries in Southeast Asia have, have, uh, have done. Uh, there was this conscious, uh, I think, decision, if you will, uh, since the 70s uh, by the leaders then of Southeast Asia to really uh, look forward to the future and then identify what kind of role uh, a country, a partner like Japan uh, should and could have in forging that future uh, together with the, the Southeast Asian states. So I think that's, um, that's the kind of, I think, conscious decision and, and, and uh, view that um, people in this part of the world have. And if we look at you know, the past 50 years or so, since um, dialogue relations were established between ASEAN and Japan, um, definitely we do see that role of Japan in, in helping the ASEAN members grow and develop. I think that role is firmly entrenched. It has been firmly entrenched over the decades, whether you know it's assistance for in infrastructure or whether it's human resources development or institutional capacity building. And uh, okay, when I was at the ASEAN Secretariat and when I was a lead researcher in the ASEAN Study Center at ICS, what I looked on was the sociocultural community. So it's it's really looking more about the people. And I think in terms of those people to people exchanges, again, that's very much something that was at the core of um, uh, Fukuda's um, heart to heart uh, diplomacy. You know, Japan instituted the Ship for Southeast Asia Youth Program long before there were more formalized uh, youth exchanges or student exchanges under Japan, you know, the ASEAN Japan framework. And um, I, I think, you know, speaking from experience as well, as, uh, Japan is, is a strong supporter of, of ASEAN integration and is offered a lot of uh, complementary programs under the initiative for ASEAN integration, um, as well as for greater Megong sub-regional development, you know, uh, either directly or through other regional mechanisms. And, and you know, we, we were just talking about Japan House. I recall that the Japan, sent, uh, sorry, Japan has, an ASEAN center in Tokyo, 
And I think that was the first of its kind, you know, e even though that was also established with a, a, a more economic view in mind to to kind of like attract, promote tourism. And also, I, I think, have that kind of awareness raising of what is Southeast Asia, what is ASEAN among, you know, the Japanese uh, citizens. So so I think, you know, the, the ASEAN Center in Tokyo, um, yeah, it, it was the first of its kind, including that that cost sharing mechanism that is so much a part of what uh, ASEAN emphasizes to its dialogue partners. Although, of course, you know, I, I think the the balance of that cost sharing still needs to be um, <laughs> worked out a bit more. Um, and again, another pioneer of its kind, if we look at um, Japan's uh, relations and interactions with ASEAN, would be something like the ASEAN Cultural Fund, which has mm. helped, I think. Uh, raise more uh, more uh, I guess more of that awareness of what it means to to have that joint collaboration and and somebody supporting what you need to do uh, or what you are interested to do in areas that uh, I think underpin uh, either the political or the the, the economic uh, relationship. So I think you know to just sum up the prevailing notion and view, is really one more of uh, Japan giving back. And I think that also probably goes into the, the high levels of trust in Japan to, you know, quote unquote, do the right thing uh, when it comes to global governance and leadership as the annual uh, State of Southeast Asia surveys organized by the um, ICS use of uh, ICS use of Ishak Institute have shown. Uh, sorry, I'm stuttering a bit. It's the afternoon here. And... <laughs> Thank you. That's so really yeah, yeah so. I add a point. So yeah, uh, the, now the more you mentioned uh, an ASEAN ASEAN Cultural Fund. So yes, this this functions very it works very well. And now this fund is is integrated into the Japan ASEAN Int Integration Fund. So which deploys a more broader and comprehensive help to the Southeast Asia. Right. Thank you. Now that's that's a really comprehensive list. Now Ben, turning to you. <laughs> Uh, do you think that Britain is approaching the relationship with ASEAN in the right way, or, or can you make some suggestions? Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, and thanks, everyone, for the, the great insights so far. I mean, just before I get to that, interesting that, that me, Professor Mioba mentions Japan's complex history in the region, because, of course, the UK also has very problematic history in Southeast Asia. It was an invader and colonial occupier of four um, Southeast Asian nations today, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Brunei, and Myanmar, also played a key role in violent suppression of the independence movements in Vietnam and Indonesia in 1945, the end of the Second World War. Um, so we also have a very complex history, and I think we've come a long way, which says something about the UK, but also importantly about Southeast Asian partners and their willingness to kind of look forward to what's possible um, to build a new relationship. Although I must say, uh, the kind of some people would view that as historical amnesia as having some negative sides too. Um, when it comes to what the UK has done with, with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, and I think its relationship with individual Southeast Asian nations, which are two different but connected questions, I think it, it's by, by and large been a good job um, since Brexit. It's hard to think of any positive dividend. Um, post-Brexit, but probably the UK getting dialogue partner status in its own right is, is one of the few things that, that's been good. Um, th that's partly because it allows the UK to intensify its relationships um, with the member states, um, as well as the organisation. But it also gives the UK a seat at the table at the premier convening group, really, for the whole of, of the region, because ASEAN anchors not just its own sort of summits and meetings, but these broader engagements like the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus, bit of a mouthful. Uh, and these are key forums that bring not just ASEAN, but other dialogue partners um, like the US, Australia, Japan, China, uh, Russia to the table to talk about security and economics and trade and other really important issues. So I think the UK put in the hard yards necessary to convince ASEAN member states um, to allow it to get its own dialogue partner status, which was not easy. ASEAN's had an informal moratorium for, I think, more than two decades on adding new dialogue partners. So the UK went about that the right way. Uh, ministers spent a lot of time in the region. 
and they spent a lot of time listening and talking about what the UK could offer the region. The challenge is going to be maintaining the energy um, in the ASEAN engagements, because I think when it comes to ASEAN, the organization, as opposed to bilateral relationships in Southeast Asia, I'm sorry to say this, uh, Mo, I know you spent a long time there, but it, it's a slow moving beast and there are not many easy wins for dialogue partners. So my fear would be that future UK governments maybe lose interest um, in, in ASEAN. And I think one thing that's always important for the member states is that dialogue partners show up at a high level, meeting in, meeting out, and there are hundreds of meetings a year. So that's the big challenge for the UK going forward. Great, thank you. Um, do you think, I mean, I'm gonna ask uh, Mo this first and then turn to me and then to Ben. Do you think a strong political relationship with ASEAN has to be grounded in a strong economic relationship? And I think the UK is currently ASEAN's eighth largest trading partner uh, for trading goods, I think. Um, but the numbers are far less than the, you know, those for China, the US, uh, Japan, the EU, or even Korea. Um, so do you think that might limit the strength of ties? Uh, maybe Mo first. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, that's a great question. And um, maybe I'll try to link to some of the very pertinent points Ben raised. Yes, uh, I may be an ASEANI, but that's, that doesn't mean I'm blind to uh, ASEAN's shortcomings as well, right? But I guess where we're coming from is that we all want um, good things. We all want to see good things rather than not so good things. Um, right, so um, strong political relationship grounded in a strong economic relationship. I think, you know, if you look back at the beginnings of ASEAN's external relations, they had both political and economic motivations, didn't they? So I think both the political and the economic relationships are important. And again, if we look at how ASEAN started those um, dialogue um, discussions first with uh, the EU and, and well, even before the EU, the EEC, and then with Japan in the early 70s, they all started with specific economic issues or interests. And uh, Mie can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think even um, the first uh, conversations between ASEAN and Japan were over uh, some kind of an uh, economic competition over um, rubber production. Um, you know, I, I was I was still a kindergarten kid at that time, but I, I think you know, it, it started with with I, I think really. Um, specific economic concerns that uh you know governments were were worried about uh, their their own uh, I, I guess you know relevance so i think uh fast forward to now when the uk uh came in as a dialogue partner uh, in 2021 i think that was a time also when asean members uh were starting to consider and and also assert if i could use that word more equality in dialogue relations. When we started, of course, you know, ASEAN was very much about, okay, uh, what's in it that uh, we can benefit from the, the technical expertise or the official development assistance, the funding support from the dialogue partners? What, um, what can the more developed uh, economies, uh, what can they offer us that very practical and pragmatic mindset but you know over the decades if anything i think even um even uh with its very slow moving nature uh, i i think that pragmatic sense has prevailed and um and also uh also added to asean's maturity of okay we we want to see uh something more equal in terms so Again, if I could also use that term about ASEAN also maturing as it moves into its next half century, uh, I mean, you know, owning up to the challenges of achieving consensus, for example, and also the difficulties of uh, consulting uh, a, a shared view, and even flexibly interpreting non-interference principles. I think we, the UK has has uh, come on board uh, to that, you know, the dialogue system train, as it were, at that particular point in time. So I guess what I'm trying to say here really is that I think the quality of the interactions also matter. What do the people in ASEAN um, in the UK as a dialogue partner? Um, I, I think there's there's a whole list of things, but you know, speaking again from the socio-cultural, from the people perspective, definitely education for one. Um, that's one of um, I think uh, the the points that came out very clearly in our annual State of Southeast Asia surveys. Uh, the UK is a preferred destination 
for education. And I think that's something that um, the UK ASEAN, uh, uh, I think, statement also recognizes that uh, that's where I think the interests of the ASEAN states and I guess the strengths or the competencies that the UK has to offer can really uh, kind of like, um, you know, provide that ground uh, for, for the future. And of course, you know, I, I think we're going to be talking about this later on, um, but let's not forget there's ASEAN in the aggregate and there's ASEAN with individual members, particular interests and strengths. So I think the bilateral security and economic relations are also important in that kind of, you know, the political economic relations that you talked about, Bill. And so those bilateral uh, level interactions and relations will also be important and complementary to the, the overall regional relationship. I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Mia, some thoughts? Yes, thank you. So I, I agree with Moe, so, and I want to add some point. So the first one is uh, generally, the economics is very linked to the uh, politics. So, and for example, to address the economic issue is a political topic, political matter. So, for example, so as I more, more and I said, I, I mentioned the the third point of the Japan ASEAN dialogue come comes from the come, came from the uh, trade friction. So, so and then so the very very uh, we have to focus on the linkage between the policy politics and economics generally the the second one is uh, well so now so asian countries as well as japan have to deal with uh, not only the economic development but also the realization of the sustainability as well as the fairness so and sometimes so excessive globalization excessive economic development resulted in the, the lack of the fairness and the harm, harm impact on the sustainability so like the climate change or something so now so asian asian society is very becoming very mature and asian society become more and uh, 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 the more diverse and then so there are many uh, stakeholders are there and so, uh, but on the other hand, the, uh, the economic gap, so within the community and among the ASEAN country are still very important. So matter for, for ASEAN. So if the so UK, so involved in the deeply in the uh, Southeast Asia and ASEAN, we have to deal with such a very um, the diverse issue with the, the ASEAN countries. And then, so not only political and economy, but also the political or the political issues and the social issue are very important for to focus on. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And Ben, any thoughts? Thanks, Bill. Um, two points I'd make. The first is, I think, yeah, the implication of the question is totally correct that for pretty much every government in Southeast Asia, economic development and the search for new trade and investment partners is key um, to their outlook. It's probably key to their tenure in office, whether they're democratic or authoritarian. So I think if you look at Jokowi in Indonesia, Marcos in the Philippines, Hun Sen in Cambodia, the Vietnamese Communist Party, Anwar Ibrahim, Malaysia, you know, they would all be united by a desire to focus on economic development and growth first above all things. And we must remember that ASEAN is not a supranational body like the EU, it's an interstate agency. So ultimately, you know, ASEAN's priorities will be set by the member states. So I think that economic engagement piece is the key. Uh, as to uh, the second point I want to make about the UK, of course, you're right that the UK isn't going to match China um, or Japan as a trading partner for most Southeast Asian nations. That's self-evident. But I think there's a broader economic offer from the UK that does tally with a lot of the, the shifting interests of Southeast Asian member states. So if we have a huge capital market in the city of London. Um, so many of our biggest British listed companies are, are big investors in Southeast Asia, the likes of HSBC, um, BP, Prudential, and many more. But there are also many small companies, mining companies, finance companies, investment companies um, that are investing in Southeast Asia uh, or have funds in Southeast Asia that have listed in London or sought to raise money in London. So we have the capital market, we have kind of the green and sustainable finance 
um, which is emerging around that, which I think is another big offer that the UK has. We have education uh, already been mentioned, some of the world's top universities, and many people want to come to the UK, you know, because of the advantages we have uh, of having colonized the world and forced much of it to speak our language, an unfair advantage, um, but one that we, we have nevertheless. Um, so I think there's a broader economic pull beyond just trade. And of course, you know, our big opportunities to trade in future will be trade in services, not trading goods. But that is more difficult um, to negotiate in, when it comes to trade agreements and the like. So I think that's the challenge for the UK and, and Southeast Asian nations is how do we come to agreements where we can get better access um, for our services um, in Southeast Asia, which can be tricky, especially with the more protectionist member states like Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, which also happen to be you know, among the biggest markets. Uh, Mohan, may any quick thoughts about how that'll be, you know, regarded in the region? Mo? Okay, uh, very quickly, um, you know, I, I was just looking at the, the fact sheet of the UK mission to ASEAN, and, and that basically, I think, outlines um, uh, the kind of ODA, the official development assistance that the UK uh, wants to uh, provide for supporting all those areas, I think, that, that Ben mentioned uh, just now. So, so I think, you know, um, very quickly from me, I, I think it's, uh, again, uh, going back to what I said about uh, coming on board as a dialogue partner at, at this juncture in time, really, I think, gives it that, that opportunity to, to bring it all together, because they are critical issues that have arisen from um, from both the, the, you know, the political and the economic um, performance legitimacy issues, shall we say. And, and I think uh, those, those issues arising from, you know, uh, that, that quest for performance legitimacy, mainly in the form of economic development and being plugged into the global uh, system, I, I think that's what we're seeing now. And, and those kinds of issues, I think climate change has been mentioned. And of course, uh, I, I think the kind of um, needs that people have after uh, disasters, whether they are natural disasters from extreme climate or weather events or from uh, other causes, I think, I think that's the kind of um, support uh, that, that, uh, that we can look to from this kind of a relationship, well as, um, you know, as, as ASEAN societies also develop and grow and mature, there's that value-based uh, component of global Britain that might be uh, become more relevant as well. Yeah, thank you. And Mia? Well, so, yes, yeah, so, yeah, I think the, basically, I think basically, so ODA as well as the investment from the UK are welcoming for the ASEAN countries. So because so ASEAN country want to have various partners so to deal with many many challenges so the economic development and climate change and so on so and then so uh, the UK UK and ASEAN and have to so uh, have to cooperate to facilitate the business uh, circumstances so for, for both sides. So I mean that the UK enterprises, as well as uh, uh, the the, uh, the ASEAN countries, the local local companies, to 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 promote their work together, so to uh, to result in the uh, more economic development, as well as uh, to deal with the sustainability, as well as the fairness, and so for the, for Southeast Asia to build the rule based so regional order is a very uh, crucial now. So now, so the UK's involvement in the Southeast Asia contributed to the, this aim and the purpose. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Now, Ben mentioned this a moment ago, um, that you know, ASEAN is an interstate organization. Uh, and so that I think you know, Japan and the UK have to work out how much they deal with the, the member governments themselves and how much they deal with the secretariat and which issue to engage on, on which level with. Um, Mia, any thoughts about the best way to do that? Yeah, of course. So uh, the UK is so currently so have to foster the good relationship with the secretariat as an individual as a member countries. So and so I really want to emphasize this point. So please, 
So keep in mind that the small power, small countries in the ASEAN are very important. So because ASEAN uh, decision making uh, process is a consensus. And then so even the very small country have a veto power and have a veto power. And then so yeah, so many countries, including Japan, in, in, were, are inclined to only focus on the great powers, uh, big powers like uh, Indonesia and Thailand. So, but so of course, uh, economically and politically, you know, Indonesia and Thailand, such a big power in the Southeast Asia, are very important. But on the other hand, Laos, Cambodia, and this, uh, the Bill Brunei, such a very small power, the small power has is a very big power as a veto power. And then, so please keep in mind that the two, uh, two don't, don't forget the importance of the small power in the ASEAN. The famous ASEAN consensus, any, any one country can, can block an agreement. Yeah. Yes, Mark, right. Yeah. Any thoughts? Right. I mean, you know, we've, we've been discussing various aspects of that, right? And, and, and this, is, this is really, again, um, what I referred to earlier on about ASEAN in the aggregate and ASEAN as, you know, individual member states. And, and, then, and then that's, that's what uh, dialogue partners also come up with, right? You have all these mechanisms that you engage with. Um, and at the same time, there's also these bilateral relations and interactions that uh, countries like the UK and, the, and Japan have with each of the um, states in Southeast Asia. Um, so if we look at um, what have been identified, say, as, you know, all these collective priorities um, at the regional level, again, you know, you've, you've got these, uh, these, these cross-cutting topics uh, also related to non-traditional security uh, that, that come up, topics like climate change. But I think post-pandemic, a lot of the ASEAN countries are also very much concerned about uh, what are going to be the the economic impact uh, uh, impacts of of uh, you know pandemic recovery going to be uh, the unemployment and the economic uh, recession fears and so on as well as um, the impacts on health and I think those continue to be the the kind of like the regional concerns and challenges that ASEAN will also present to its dialogue partners to work together with them. Interestingly, though. In the 2022 um, State of Southeast Asia survey, the respondents from Myanmar ranked human rights as uh, their top concern. So again, uh, this is also to link on to what Mie was uh, mentioning earlier about, uh, you know, different states have, different member states in ASEAN have, uh, you may, maybe have different priorities, the smaller states or what's going on in each of these states also uh, may have uh, some bearing and relevance on what they view can come out of the, the regional relationship. And of course, never far from people's minds in this part of the world is um, the, the concern about you know, increased military tensions arising from potential flashpoints. So I'm going to fall back on something that I usually say uh, wearing my ASEAN hat about you know, aligning or well, maybe sinking might be a better word to use, sinking the regional commitments with national interests or strengths. And I think Japan is, is quite good at doing that. Japan has been very good at doing that in the past few decades. But I, I think, you know, we're in the 21st century. Uh, we also need to move with the times and I think not just fall back on past precedent all the time. So, um, so I think that's what uh, is at the back of my mind when I uh, keep talking about uh, maybe the people-centered topics taking more centered stage in most countries and in global discourse. And I think that's where uh, maybe the regional relationship and bilateral interactions uh, may need to find some adjustment in, in you know, addressing uh, voice and accountability issues at the domestic level, uh, as well as maybe, you know, um, government's interest to, to seek assurances of security. Um, but I think uh, at the end of it all, if, if we look at it, um, there is this very big uh, concern about uh, minimizing political instability or basically instability in the region. That's a regional concern. That's definitely also uh, uh, on the domestic priority of, of the member states. And probably this is where, you know, the Myanmar example the, the Myanmar case uh, becomes so so pertinent uh, because you know we've seen 
different approaches and rationales on, on uh, dealing with or addressing the ongoing crisis in Myanmar. We've seen since uh, 2021, uh, you know, these divided views and approaches regionally, as well as among the different dialogue partners of ASEAN, uh, particularly those in the region and who, you know, who have long borders with Myanmar. So, so I think um, uh, this is also uh, one of the topics where I think um, how the, the, the regional cooperation agenda goes ahead or moves along uh, with dialogue partner contributions and efforts and how I think uh, each of our different bilateral interactions uh, with, uh, say, a country like Myanmar now under military rule, under the uh, military regime of the State Administration Council and dealing with um, uh, those diplomatic um, uh, difficulties and complexities there, I, I think that really, I, you know, makes us think of, 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 of that regional and national uh, sinking of priorities and commitments. At the end of it all, there's this responsibility to implement. I think I said that seven years ago. And so what does that responsibility to implement means when we talk about our regional commitments, particularly the ASEAN member states who have all signed on to these regional commitments? Mm -hmm. And of course, the dialogue partners that have also signed on to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation that commits them to working with ASEAN. Yeah, and obviously today, you know, we're all thinking about Myanmar quite, quite, quite closely. Um, Mia, I mean, in terms of its relationship with, I mean, Japan has continued to engage to some extent with the with the military authorities in uh, in Myanmar. Would you, is that fair to say? Whereas Britain has obviously taken a much more, um, you know, kind of rejectionist approach, I suppose you might say. Um, anything that you think, you know, that Japan's experience with Myanmar can teach us? Yes, so uh, in the past, uh, Japan has been had had been very tolerant to the the various regimes in the Southeast Asia, not only Southeast Asia, not in and, and, and but in the whole of the whole of the world. It means that sometimes Japan is very tolerant to the uh, authoritarian regime. So, but but this Myanmar case is a little bit different. So the Japanese government so condemn the the. Uh, now authoritarian regime in the Myanmar. So, but on the other hand, some Japanese enterprises the, the, uh, still stayed the, their uh, the branch, branches so in the Myanmar. And then so, and then some, some uh, such uh, company uh, tend to be very crit criticized in the Japan, but they, they such a company uh, uh, still they try to, to keep them and keep the economic and the business relationship with the authoritarian regime. I, I think it's so bad thing. But on the other hand, the Japanese, uh, the government, so statement is very strict. So toward the Mamiya issue. And then, so I found some symptom of the change of the Japanese uh, stance to the human rights issue in the Southeast Asia and Asia. Great, thank you. Uh, ben, any thoughts? Ben. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Well, I, I think countries take, have taken a variety of approaches to, to the junta and to what's happened in Myanmar since the coup. And I guess that has to be, um, that flexibility is important in a sense, right, to try different things. And Japan has its own approach where values isn't so much at front and center of its foreign policy. It tends to be more so um, for the UK when it, when it suits us, um, but not always when we want to look the other way. Um, ultimately, I think what happens in Myanmar is going to be decided on the ground and by the balance of power between you know, the, the military as it brutalizes its own people and the different forces, democratic forces and ethnic armed groups that are aligning against it. But I think it would be helpful if ASEAN's dialogue partners could have more of a conversation among ourselves to try and find some common ground about you know, where we can work together, but not just the UK and Japan and the US and those that are like-minded, but we actually need to be talking to, to China about what's going on in Myanmar. We need to talk to India, um, which if you think sort of Japan has taken a soft approach to the junta, um, India is, is, is far more close uh, in its talks um, with, with, with the military mm -hmm. there. So I think that's where uh, we need a broader conversation rather than outside powers just saying, this is ASEAN's problem. Um, I think we actually need to engage, you know, maybe privately and quietly at quite a high level 
Um, because there's probably about 10 or 15 countries in the world that have a special interest or some special levers um, in Myanmar. And we're, we're not going to be able to solve um, you know, the internal problems, but we might be able to help um, you know, on the way out at some point and to kind of keep some basic level of humanitarian assistance, um, some support channels for the, the opposition, the national unity government as well. And just to better understand what, what China, what India, what others are up to, even when that differs, that approach differs quite significantly from how we're approaching the situation. Great, thank you. Now we've got some pretty good questions uh, in the Q&A box and I'd encourage other people to, to add them. Um, Jeremy Grant asks, uh, points out that some of Japan's trading houses like Mitsui, Mitsubishi, uh, played a hugely significant role in developing ties with Southeast Asia. Is there anything that the UK can learn from this? Uh, and he points out that the, uh, the British government's uh, development finance institution, uh, British International Investment, is opening an office in Singapore. Um, Mia, any thoughts about the role that the trading houses, uh, Sogo Shocha, played in the, um, uh, the history, in, in, in the development of, of ties? Yeah. Yes, so I do I, I do know deeply much about uh, this uh, ex uh, economic experiences, but so my point is that so the, now the ASEAN countries so is developing that and the economic situation is changed changing from the past. So I mean, so at the at the first stage, so and the middle stage, Japanese enterprises have a very principal role to to contribute to economic development in the Southeast Asia. That's true. But on the other hand, the current situation is a little bit different. So now the Southeast Asia so, and the government can get the, um, an investment from the many countries, many enterprises all over the world, including the UK and US, US and China. So of course China. And then so the, I mean, the, the, the root of the investment is become very diverse. And then, so the level of the economic development is uh, also very changing. Now, Thailand tried to um, uh, overcome at the middle trap uh, the problem. And then, so it's a very different, different uh, the, uh, situation in which the Mitsubishi uh, could contribute to the Thailand development. And then, so UK and the other countries and the enterprises, including Japan and uh, UK and the other countries, have to see, look, the, uh, the uh, economic realities. So in the Southeast Asia, in the current situation, and then so then they think about the, what 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 uh, the project uh, is effective to contribute to the development. So in the Southeast Asia, and to get the profit from profit from that situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Any thoughts on on the on the role that these big companies play in uh, in making the connections and, and making the relationship work? Um, the dialogue relationship, you mean? Or just, Sorry, I, guess, I guess underpinning the dialogue because you have these strong economic forces or these interest groups at work. Well, look, yeah, it is complex, right? Because, you know, Ben made a very pertinent observation earlier on about ASEAN being an intergovernmental organization, not supranational. And therefore, um, it is, I, I think, the, the, the voice, the views, the perspectives, the decisions of the governments or the, the heads of state and government that make the final decision that count. But at the national level, right, at the domestic level, there are, there are these different uh, interests, economic interests and so on. So I think there is that dynamic going on. It's, it's neither one or the other. And I think... Um, that's where the complexity also is, because again, I mean, it's it's the two year mark of the coup in Myanmar and all, but we also see, uh, you know, some elements of maybe strong economic interests, maybe playing in on uh, the hesitancy of some governments in the international community to to move decisively or to to try and balance things out as well. Uh, I'll say that much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, is... Bill, if I could just, yes, yes, just jump in quickly. I mean, obviously the structure of the UK's economy is very, very different from that of Japan's. And we don't have the kind of Japan Inc. Uh, relationship between our biggest companies and, and our government that Japan has had, particularly you know, in, in the past. 
But the UK's advantage economically is that we're a very open, you know, perhaps one of the world's most open economies. And I think that this kind of business channel on all sides is a really important one. The UK government can help that, I think, at the margins by helping to promote economic reform in Southeast Asia through technical assistance and through development assistance. Um, but there's a big opportunity for UK companies to do more themselves. And also the other way around, right? For, for Southeast Asian investors to come to the UK, uh, we're a really trusted place to invest. And we are generally quite open. And, and some, of, you know, some of our big um, assets uh, are owned by Southeast Asian companies. The, the Battersea Power Station redevelopment, which is pretty impressive, was done by a Malaysian company. Selfridges, I think, was recently bought by, by Central Group of, of Thailand. So I think it's an important channel to build relationships on both sides. And it's not as if the UK government has that much extra cash to invest in building out these relationships with, with Southeast Asia. So I think we do need people. We need um, people to be able to ties. That's not just about education and tourism. That's also really importantly about business. And across Southeast Asia, I think business elites do exert a lot of influence in the political environment, sometimes unhealthily so. Um, but it's a really important channel of influence. Great, thank you. Um, ben, I'm going to stay with you because uh, Joseph Black asked a question. Um, in, in effect, what do you think uh, a Labour government uh, coming to power in Britain, it might take two years, uh, might do to uh, adjust the relationship between the UK and ASEAN? Thanks for the question. Well, we did just have David Lammy speak at Chatham House, so you can read his, his remarks where he set out, I guess, it's not really his vision, but the, the, uh, some of the early thinking around what his vision for foreign policy under what looks now to be a likely Labour government might be. I mean, th there wasn't much in there about Southeast Asia. Um, I think there's been a slight shift, actually, in, in David Lammy and Labour's comments about foreign policy. So um, initially, when the Conservative government was pushing its Indo-Pacific tilt, as they called it, um, Labour was pushing back, saying this is sort of typical Boris Johnson, empty, flummery, uh, there's nothing there. And he's basically abandoning responsibilities in Europe to go on this sort of global Britain fantasy tour. And that was how they were painting the tilt. The language has shifted, I think, uh, as they've, it's become more likely that they're going to form the next government. And I would expect they would largely inherit most of the settings on the Indo-Pacific um, policies overall. Um, including Southeast Asia. Um, so I don't think there'll be much difference there. I, I think the challenge would be, as, as I hinted earlier, to maintain the level of engagement in Southeast Asia and with ASEAN, um, because the UK government can't prioritize all parts of the world all the time uh, at a time when government budgets are really, really constrained. So ultimately, how do we do more in Southeast Asia while we're also doing more in Europe and around Ukraine uh, without doing less in other parts of the world. And I'm not sure yet, to be frank, um, that the Labour Party or the Conservative Party uh, or other kind of, and others in the foreign policy establishment are ready to make that kind of decision to commit to Southeast Asia and withdraw resources from other places. Uh, but that, in the end, that's what's going to be necessary unless we're willing to increase our diplomatic budget, which I think would be great, um, but doesn't look likely under a Labour government either, frankly. And just a little kind of asterisk there, we're expecting the announcement of the refreshed integrated review uh, at some point in the next couple of months. Um, and so we'll see a bit more about how the UK is willing to, to spend and prioritise um, there. Um, now, a question, I mean, looking to the sort of the bigger picture, the big politics here, a question from Matt Engman. Um, with the UK and Japan both aligned with the US Indo-Pacific strategy, how can the UK and Japan mitigate the risks of fragmentation in ASEAN, the ASEAN countries being pulled in different directions by US-China competition, uh, and maintain ASEAN as an important platform for multilateralism? Who would like to go first on that? Uh, Mia? Mm. Yes, thank you. So it's very difficult and tough question to answer. So because so Japan uh, does not always follow the, uh, the U U.S. and uh, in the Pacific strategy. So I mean, so uh, the Japan have uh, tried to keep the room to cooperate with China. 
So in the it's in the Pacific strategy. And on the other hand, so the U and the US in the Pacific strategy try to encounter the rise of China. So and then so sometimes so the the US and Japan's view on the Indo-Pacific are diverse. So it, uh, it, uh, it, it's a premise. And then, so I'm, I'm not sure, so what is a clear so objection, objective of the UK's Indo-Pacific strategy sometimes, of course. So you know, I can see the UK uh, demonstrate it will to involve in the Indo-Pacific uh, Indo issues. I understand. So, but so, what is the real aim? So, of the UK to encounter the China or the to to keep the uh, good relationship with China as well as to enhance to uh, enhance the relationship with uh, Japan and uh, the other countries like the India and the Australia and so on. So, and then so. And um, I'm not sure. So what is the real aim of the, the UK in terms of the Indo-Pacific? And then so maybe US and you, uh, if the US, Japan and the UK enhance its, uh, its linkage so too much, maybe it result in their concern of the Southeast Asia. So because Southeast Asian countries want to take side, take side, so they want to don't want to choose the one side. So U.S. and China, uh, they do not want to be involved in the U.S. 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 Uh, China rivalry. If so, if the Japan and the U.K. and the U.S. So tighten their uh, their linkage, yeah, the strategic linkage very tighten, and then so to 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 involve in the south, uh, try to involve in the Southeast Asia, maybe it le at least leading to leading to the uh, very strong concern in among the Southeast Asia. And then so that we have to be very cautious about how to how these three countries so co collaborate with the other to involve in the Southeast Asia. I mean, so maybe so we have to individually so in, in, engaged in the Southeast Asia. So of course, uh, the, the majority in the Japan, majority in Japanese uh, and political circle, so uh, are uh, the, uh, an opposite, opposite to direction. So the, some people, the Japan and the UK and the US try to, to tighten their collaboration towards the Southeast Asia, but I don't think so. So I mean, so each country have each interest in the Southeast Asia. And we have to uh, think about the, uh, uh, the South, South Asia the hedging strategy. And then so we have to uh, kind of approach individually to the Southeast Asia. This is my point, uh, my, my, my opinion. Great, thank you. Mo, any thoughts on managing US-China competition and whether the fact that the UK and Japan are aligned with the US broadly, does that affect how they engage with ASEAN? Uh, I think Mia said it really comprehensively and eloquently. Um, you know, here in Southeast Asia, of course, the 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 reality of the picture is is as Mia painted, right? We've got this big neighbor to the north that's like really present in this region. And and there's this there's this awareness, uh, I think, through all the Southeast Asian countries of you know China's large footprint in the region. Um, but at the same time, whether or not that large footprint is viewed, uh, you know, uh, with uh, any any level of sanguinity is is another thing. I mean, you know, uh, again, I, I keep falling back on our annual surveys that we do, but that's because we really want to track the sentiments of um, those who are in the position of informing policy or actually giving inputs to policy here in the region. The awareness that China's uh, presence politically or economically in this region is is large and, and you know it has basically you know has that impact on on countries in the region does not necessarily translate into trust. And I think there's this big fear, of course, of you know um, how that large footprint, how that large presence might also impinge on countries' sovereignties and foreign policy. So I think that's the kind of um, uh, attitudes we we have here in this part of the world. And and I think uh, the the views then towards these uh, other 
types of uh, regional security arrangements like the Quad or the AUKUS, for example, if you look at it, the preference is it's not that ASEAN member states or you know, countries in Southeast Asia uh, are, are suspicious of those arrangements, but I think they want to see what comes out of those uh, you know, security arrangements that actually um, helps the, the Southeast Asian countries on other areas of security that relate to say uh, vaccines, for example, or climate change. So they want to see it in that sense rather than that kind of hard choices that I, I think, you know, um, what was being put on the table just now. Great, thank you. And Ben, a, a minute or two, and, and any thoughts on, on this? Well, I think fragmentation is a real risk, not just about China, but look at how divided ASEAN is at the moment over how to respond to what's going on in, in Myanmar. Um, and look at the fact that ASEAN member states basically underfund the secretariat of, of ASEAN. Um, so when I was there recently, you could see how overworked people were. Um, so, so there are a lot of, of pressures, to be clear. And of course, US-China competition and the response to it adds, adds another one, because ASEAN centrality can't just be asserted by member states or by dialogue partners either. It's something that has to be kind of demonstrated and maintained. And to my mind, initiatives like the Quad, um, to a lesser extent AUKUS, but even things like the CPTPP, they do represent alternative kind of centers of ge geopolitical gravity and geoeconomic gravity in the region that if, if the Quad leaders meeting becomes annualized and important, in necessarily the East Asia summit and ASEAN leaders meetings look a bit less relevant at setting the agenda for the broader region. But you can't just sort of wish these things away. They're happening in response to real changes. So the challenge for Southeast Asia, I think, is to find more internal coherence, uh, to find ways to push integration, which is really hard uh, with the Myanmar question, but also Timor-Leste uh, meant to be joining. Um, it's got approval in principle to do so. So that's the challenge for ASEAN member states, not just to say, don't ignore us, uh, don't ignore ASEAN centrality, don't undermine us, but ASEAN member states have to show why they matter too, right? And we also have to show that we're serious about engaging. So I think it'll take both sides, but that's going to be difficult because there are so many different forces pulling apart and multilateralism is really, really hard. It's not something that's easy for any country, as evidenced by the UK, which left its own uh, regional body in, in the last few years and is now in a very messy situation. Um, so I think it's going to take a lot of work on all sides. There's no easy answers there. Right. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, lots of British conversations still come back to Brexit, don't they? <laughs> um, my, my thanks to, to all of you for taking part. And uh, sorry to, we have had so many questions and I'm really sorry that we haven't been able to uh, get to all of them. Um, I hope we'll be able to address those in future events. Uh, my thanks to the three panelists today, uh, Ben Bland from Chatham House, Mia Oba of Kanagawa University, and Mo Tuzar from the IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. Thanks also to our partners, Japan House in London. The last in this series of three webinars will examine the prospects for Japan's G7 presidency this year, and we'll let you know the date for that when it's confirmed. Chatham House aims to be the leading foreign affairs think tank in the UK, and we always welcome your participation. If you'd like more information about the work of the Asia Pacific program and other parts of our work, please check the website, chathamhouse.org. Thanks to everybody for taking part. Uh, we've had a great audience and great panelists and see you again soon. Bye-bye.